Let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 12, if we would. Luke chapter 12. We kind of shot through in a general message of uh, the new sections in Luke. This morning we're going to come in a little closer. I'd like to read verse 11 and 12 first. We're not going to get to 11 and 12. But I want to start with 11 and 12. Luke 12. We're going to start in verse 1 this morning, but I want to look at 11 and 12. And when they bring you into synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, be not anxious how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. When Christianity began, to proclaim Christ publicly was to take your life in your hands. You could be killed, you could be stoned, Stephen was. And the synagogues were not a friendly place. Um, And then the Roman government wasn't a friendly place government in many ways. It became in the early church history a capital offense to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And yet the gospel went on. And in chapter 11, and or I mean verse 11 and 12, the Lord Jesus is giving instructions for things that are going to happen after he's died and risen again, ascended. He's talking about the future. Things we see in the book of Acts. Things we see down through church history until he returns. So he's anticipating his people being hauled into uh, religious courts and civil courts and having to stand up on that occasion. Not to defend themselves but using it as a platform to witness. It's a fascinating section of Scripture. We don't have yet that threat in the United States, but it's pretty obvious the satanic powers are moving the world into a more hostile position against the gospel. Uh, Pastors in Canada, this Sunday, this Sunday, now face government persecution for proclaiming certain biblical truths, threats of arrest, and fines this Sunday. We should remember them. And not just that they wouldn't get fined or wouldn't get imprisoned, but that they would be bold to proclaim God's truth. The the hostile rebellion of our culture is right there with Canadian culture on the issues that they've outlawed uh, God's people to be for. And um, so it's very important for us to think about that as we come to this section of Scripture this morning. And so we'll do that. Uh, without getting into those issues, I want to mention that in light of our text. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, bless me as I speak in each of us as we come before you today. And may we not be so careful as to simply think of defending ourselves in such situations that we could have a successful day in court by getting off of the charges or something like that or the fines but that we would think of success as a platform to proclaim Christ, whether that confrontation comes in our own home, around the table, or in the school, or in the courtroom, or in the neighborhood. We pray that you'd help us to be ready for those things and successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're moving into a rather large section of the Gospel of Luke. 
which will require longer preaching sections. I didn't say longer sermons. I said longer preaching sections. They are sections that actually need to be dealt with uh, by looking at the whole section and not just uh, going maybe as slow as we've had to go or needed to go or wanted to go before. Luke 15 is a good example of that. Uh, you've got 32 verses that really need to be seen together. The parable of the prodigal son is preceded by the lost sheep and the lost coin. Uh, and uh, they really all need to see, be seen together. Luke 16 has two large sections, uh, but one little section in the middle. And there's a lot more of that coming. So we actually may be, seem to be picking up steam as we move through the Gospel of Luke. But it's really that we need to look at these sections as a bigger unit than maybe some of the ones we've looked at before. Now, as we begin chapter 12, uh, we notice in chapter 12 there's 59 verses. And that's a large chapter. And in this chapter, the Lord Jesus is mainly teaching his disciples. Uh, And while the crowd's listening in, when we look in chapter 12, verse 1, it actually mentions thousands of people, maybe even 10,000. The Greek word can indicate that. Uh, and it, it's a many thousands, ESV translates it. This was a, an incredibly big crowd that's following Jesus at this point. It's the background for this. If you've ever been to a concert or a ball game or, a, a, and you're in a stadium or you're, you're, and, and the crowd is behind you and people are moving and you're thinking, this is a little intimidating. I could get trampled here. And I mentioned this before, another, uh, my, the one, my one memory that sticks out more than other crowds that I've been in was coming, at, we were in Edinburgh, Scotland on vacation and we went to the military tattoo. That's where all the military bands play. The queen goes to that. She wasn't there that night. I don't know. She had another night. But we, uh, we were in that stadium. They had a stadium there by, uh, below the castle Thousands of people are there. And that it was drizzling rain, but nobody left. It was a big group, wonderful performance. Well, time to go, and we left. And the streets of Edinburgh are very narrow. And so what you have is a crowd of people at night swarming out of the stadium and you've got a river of people behind you and around you. It's a very inter- it was a very interesting experience. Uh, I would say almost intimidating. And there was eight of us there. I think it was eight. And we're being pushed along in the dark by this crowd behind us. Nobody's trying to trample anybody, but it's still, it's moving. Because the rain's starting to come down more. And I remember as we were dealing with that, we just happened to pass a small pizza place. And I said, that's for us. <laughs> we went, we just got out of there. It's like heading for the bank when the, when the river's overflowing. We got in that pizza place and just kind of let everybody go by. And uh, it wasn't that I was so hungry for pizza, but that's what we got <laughs> while we were waiting. Now, Jesus was of sterner stuff than I was. Here is a crowd, probably in a street, probably in some city street, and they're trampling on each other. That's what it says. The people are stepping all over each other. It's a crowd of thousands. They're stepping all over each other. And what is Jesus doing? Is he looking for an exit? He starts teaching. It's amazing to me. It's just, (laughs) apparently, (coughs) pardon me, He was quite used to crowds, big crowds, intimidating crowds. And it was rather a normal experience for him. And so he wasn't looking like to get away. He's just using, teaching it and teaching the disciples. So he starts speaking and he keeps speaking for 59 verses. But while the crowd is there, he's really teaching his disciples. So he's teaching his disciples with the crowd listening in. 
Now, he couldn't always get into private, so he had to disciple people in public. And so he's doing that. And now, what this means for us is that we're looking at this situation, and Jesus is teaching for 59 verses. He's interrupted twice. Once in verse 13, which was not a really good question, and once in verse 41, which was a very good question. And he responds to both. That's the only time anybody else says anything. So it's a long teaching section by the Lord. Now, our section is very easy to mark off because it's interrupted by a question in verse 13 that was off subject. And I, 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 I really don't like this man. <laughs> I, I've been very upset if I was there and heard this guy interrupt the Lord in this marvelous teaching and took, took everybody's attention in another direction. But the Lord just took it in stride. But what, ver what, what that means for us is that verses 1 to 12 is a preaching section. It's a section we can look at as a unit out of these 59 verses. And that's the way to read the Bible, study the Bible, look for these markers, these division markers, and to try to get it into units that kind of go together and compare that unit with what comes next and, and what went before and all that stuff. So it's all going, everything in verses 1 and following is aiming at verses 11 and 12. So there's a flow to this. And the Lord is preparing his own to be in that situation of public persecution and arrest and having to speak uh, up in a situation like that. That's what he's doing. So it's all going somewhere. And it ends with confessing Christ before hostile people that are trying to get you in trouble. And this marvelous promise that the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time. And give you what you need to say in a public place. Under public pressure. That's what it's all about. Now, in those days, to be go before the synagogue or go before the Sanhedrin or go before a Roman governor, that could mean death, right? It's life or death. But the Lord's not talking about defending yourself, trying to get yourself off, as much as using that as a platform to witness. This is very convicting, isn't it? It'd be very easy to think, I got, Lord, I need help. How do I get out of this? How do I avoid being found guilty. He's not even talking about that. His concern is, you've got a public platform, use it. Let God take care of the rest. That's what he's doing. Some, sometimes we get too concerned with uh, results, too concerned with um, how things are going to turn out, and not concerned with what we're really here to do to get the gospel out. And so that's the picture in this section <coughs> and so by the way that's not COVID that's my normal sign of strange <laughs> so the Lord's looking ahead at what's going to happen after he dies rises again and the church is down here ministering not just in the first century second century third century but all the way through and I can't help but think of verse 11 and 12 in light of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms or John Huss, or Polycarp, and some of those great moments in church history where men were on trial for their life. And, but for us, it may not be that. It just might be a moment at the dinner table with family and an unsafe family member, and they're ripping us because we're a Christian or something, and we have an opportunity. Or on the job, or a gathering of friends, or a classroom situation where a professor tries to embarrass us because we're a Christian. 
I remember my Old Testament class at OU, the very first day the professor said, how many in here are Christians? That was his first question. Oh, he was smooth as glass. Really fun guy. Had donuts for people every day. But he wanted to put us all on the spot. He wanted to know. So about 12 of us raised our hands. And he spent the rest of the semester tearing apart the Old Testament. Every class. This goofy thing, that goofy theory. And... uh, Finally, he said, well, now we know the Bible's not true. We're going, to have, we're going to teach you Marxism. Well, that was a long time ago. That kind of stuff still goes on. And one thing he wouldn't do, though, not one of us who raised our hand would he ever call on. Ever. One time I had my, two or three times I had my hand up the whole period. He was always nice to us. We had no voice in that class. And so we get in situations like that sometimes. By the way, our New Testament prof back then was very pro-Christian. He was at least he wasn't anti-Christian. And that was a much easier class. But how do we prepare for situations where we get an opportunity, where God gives us in his providence an opportunity, and we have an opportunity to speak up? And not necessarily defend ourselves, but defend the Lord and the gospel. And that's what this is all about. And what we're going to, I'm actually going to break the section up. I'm not going to teach it all. It's very tempting to teach it all. Some guys that are better Bible teachers than me have done that well. But I want us to see it as a unit, even though we can't take it all in one Sunday. And here is where Jesus puts the emphasis. Not where we would think it would be. Uh, When we have a public place to speak in, especially if it's an intimidating place, we want to be prepared. We want to make sure our message is prepared. At least I do. When I went down to the conference, I went very hard to be prepared for the messages I gave. But Jesus here is emphasizing something different. The preparation of the speaker, not of the message. Very interesting what he does. He wants to prepare the speakers. And preparation of the speaker is actually more important than preparation of a message in that situation. Now, this is not an anti-preparation uh, section of the Bible. Oh, we don't have to prepare. Just say whatever comes into your head in Sunday school or Bible class or morning worship. No, we should pre- when we have time to prepare and when we're teaching God's people, uh, we should prepare. We should study. We should work. But there are times when there's no time to prepare. And no need to prepare. And a time of persecution is like that. Those spontaneous times where, boom! We didn't expect to be there at the dinner table. The conversation has gone in this direction. Now, what do I do? The Holy Spirit will teach you. That's what he said. The Holy Spirit shall teach you in that same hour what you ought to say. Um, so that's what's going on. How do we get to that place where the Holy Spirit will teach us? Spontaneously, extemporaneously. He'll just give it to us. What to say? These first verses will teach us. And the first verses are emphasizing the preparation of the speaker, not the speaker's message. If the speaker is prepared spiritually, the Holy Spirit will have access to him and give him what he needs to say. I'm not talking about more revelation. I'm talking about illumination. 
So, anyhow. So how, how do we get prepared? How do we get to that place? What is the, what's the kind of person the Holy Spirit can speak to in a time like that? That's what these early verses are dealing with, and that's what we're going to deal with this morning. So let's look at that. Chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, thousands of people, inasmuch as they trod on one another, he began to say to his disciples, First of all, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, neither hidden, that it shall not be known. Therefore, whatever you've spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you've spoken in the private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Hypocrisy is a very short-sighted policy. Why would you pretend to be something you're not? Jesus is coming. The books are going to be open. Everything's going to be known. So take the mask off now. And the exhortation in these first three verses is be real. Be real. Back in my day, teenagers would say, get real. <laughs> this says, be real. Real. It's the opposite of hypocrisy. Be candid, sincere, genuine, guileless, open, the real McCoy, a straight shooter. Be real. Don't be wearing a mask. Nothing to put on to impress people. Total openness about who we are and who we aren't. Not trying to impress people with our piety of putting on a show. How do you be real? Well, you don't want to be a Pharisee because they weren't real. There might have been some of them that were, but a lot of them weren't. If you want to be real, one thing you have to do is be born again. When it comes to be the religious realm, right? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was an old Pharisee. But he wasn't even saved. He was teaching other people the Bible and wasn't saved himself. So even though he seems to be a sincere guy somewhat, uh, there was things lacking in his life and he didn't even understand the new birth and he's teaching the Bible. So you've got to be born again to be real because everyone that's not born again is not real. If, no matter how religious they are, they're just promoting themselves and fooling themselves and others. Paul wasn't real before he was saved. He was a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee, but he lacked the new birth. That guy in Luke 18 was another Pharisee. God, I thank you. I'm not as other men. Oh yeah, you are like other men. You're sinners just like everybody else. You're fooling yourself. You're faking yourself out. So that's the picture. Jesus had a favorite adjective for Pharisees. He used it all the time. And he didn't say it behind their back. He said it to their face. Hypocrite. You hypocrites. He said it so much, the Bible is just full of it. Um, turn with me to Matthew 6, 6, 2. 6, hold your place in Luke. Matthew 6, 2. Just watch this a little bit. Take heed, you do not your arms before moms, before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your fathers in heaven. Therefore, when you do thy arms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. And in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Verily, I say, you, they have their reward. So the hypocrites would do that. The Pharisees were good at that. But when you do your arms, let not your left hand know what your right hand does that your alms may be seen in secret. The Father who sees in secret reward thee openly. And when you pray, be not like the hypocrites are. He's talking about the Pharisees. That's, that's, that's the crowd he's talking about. And he says in verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of sad continence, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to fast. Hypocrites want people to think well of them. They want people to think, look up to them. They're hiding them real self. 
They're putting on a show. That's what the Pharisaical religion was. All that strictness of Sabbath keeping and nitpicking of tithing. It, they always put on a show. And Jesus really rips them in Matthew 23. He calls them, I forget it, 10 or 12 times. It's an awful amount. He just keeps hammering that. It's a wonder they didn't kill him right there. So they, they were fake, as you've heard me say, they're fake as grandpa's hair and grandma's teeth. They were fakes. They were religious frauds. And they didn't know it. They were unsaved. They were unregenerate. They're trying to impress people with their high standards. But <coughs> all their legalism was nitpicking on stuff that they'd made up. They couldn't really keep the Bible, so they made up rules they could keep. D.L. Moody said, I have had more trouble with myself than with any man I've ever met. There's an honest guy, right? I'm my worst enemy. I've had more trouble with myself than any man I've ever met. Moody wasn't putting on airs. He was being truthful. Now, we don't have to tell all the, people, all the dirty details of our sins. I don't believe that's edifying. Let all things be done to edifying, right? You don't want to hear about all my sins. And I don't want to hear about all yours, all the details. But we, sh we should never give people the, the impression we're better than we are. As much as possible, we want to be real. We don't want to hide behind a mask. Have you ever heard the term salesman fa salesman's face? It, it, if you, <laughs> you ever deal with salesmen, you, they got the salesman face. I don't think they try to do it. It's just there, you know. And they're going to sell you something, and they're your best bud, and they got the best deal, and they, they got the salesman's face on. And you know you're not getting the real person. You're just getting the salesman. And there's people that do that to you that aren't even salesmen. <laughs> they got to be nice to you, so they're putting it on. And the Pharisees were like that. So the Lord Jesus uh, is very strong here against this kind of thing. And uh, he says, beware of the... Uh, Leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He's very strong. And these folks were deaf and blind to what the Bible really said. And they couldn't understand the real meaning of Scripture. So they kind of made up their own interpretations and, and uh, went wild on that. Have you ever heard someone say, I don't go to church because all the hypocrites are? Everybody here's heard that. Well, I like to say something like this. Hmm, that's interesting. You're not very much like Jesus because he went to the synagogue and it was full of hypocrites. He even ate with hypocrites. So that's very interesting. And Jesus knew what they were. But, he, but when he went to the synagogue, he didn't pretend. He didn't pretend they were better than they were. He confronted them to their face. Wouldn't to God everybody that says everybody in church is a hypocrite would come to church and confront the hypocrites. <laughs> That'd probably be good for everybody, right? And hope they, they could take it as well as give it out. So, very important. The natural man cannot receive uh, the things of God. He doesn't know them. And the Pharisees who weren't born again couldn't get the real message, so they kind of made up their own. Now, um, the hypocrites need to be confronted, not ignored. Jesus confronted them. He confronted them here in this crowd. Everybody in the crowd heard what he said. The warning about the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And they talked about the warning, leaven of the Herod, Herodians and the leaven of the Sadducees. But here he picks out the Pharisees. <clears throat> he already made these people mad. A lot of that crowd was just probably like uh, a crowd following a fire truck. There's a fight coming. We want to see it. And who knows? But what an amazing thing. But his teaching here is very fascinating. He's saying this is a very short-sighted thing, this hypocrisy religion, because everything's going to come out. On the judgment day. 
And so he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Well, why should we worry about hypocrisy? For there's nothing covered, nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hidden that shall not be known. Therefore, whatever you've spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you've spoken in the ear in private will be proclaimed on the housetops. Incredible, interesting verse. Remember in Malachi 3, Malachi says, then you'll know who serves God and who serves him not. There's coming a day when you're going to know when God makes up his jewels and who's real and who's not. And <coughs> Romans 2.16 talks about God judging the secrets of men by Paul's gospel. Men have secrets from each other. Men have secrets from themselves. Men put on. And Jesus said, beware of that. Even Christians can get into that. Even real people can get into that. Now don't go confessing all your wicked sins and all their details to people, but certainly don't. don't that's not edifying, but certainly don't, none of us should pretend we're better than we are. I've got a friend that illustrated it this way. He says, you, you, you know, Bill, I think we're all like one cow patty bragging to another cow patty, patty how he smells better than the other one does. <laughs> It's pretty graphic, but it's probably about right. We get, none of us got anything to brag about, right? A.W. Tozer said, A Pharisee is hard on others and easy on himself, but a spiritual man is easy on others and hard on himself. Get the difference? Um, R.T. France says, Those who are preoccupied with immediate concerns, what other people think, are in danger of missing what ultimately matters. Uh, these are a warning about thinking you can get away with pretending to be what you're not. That's the essence of hypocrisy. By the way, if you're unsaved, admit it. Why would you try to hide that? Admit it to yourself, admit it to others, and then hopefully get saved. There's a lot of people that have to come to that place. I'm a church girl, but I'm not saved. I need to be born again. Admit it. That's a good thing. <clears throat> John Wesley had to admit it. He was already a missionary to America. Found out he was unsaved. And so, may God help us to see that. And what it's talking about in, in the next verse is uh, our true nature is going to be shown in the future on the judgment day. So why are we trying to be something we're not now? Just admit it and get it over with. And if we're not saved, get saved. The Bema seat's going to be a place of revealing. The great white throne's going to be a place of revealing. There's not going to be any unreality there. So be real. Be honest with ourselves. Ironside said, it's so easy to pretend to be more than we are. And one of those things is, I'm on a roll. There's a crowd that's, what, that's the background of this, right? And I, many believe, uh, Daryl Bach, that the, the crowd was maybe exciting the apostles. Hey, we're going to kind of roll. Look at this crowd. And Jesus is warning his disciples in light of the popular crowd to be careful about hypocrisy. Don't try to pretend you're better than you are just to get the crowd to like you or keep liking you. Barclay said, a hypocrite is never genuine. He's always play acting. The basis of hypocrisy is insincerity. Very short-sighted policy. Um, and if you're struggling with sin, admit it to somebody. Help pray for me. I've got a problem with this. Don't tell them the dirty details. That just messes with their head. Just say, I've got a problem. I need help. So we should not aspire to have people to think of us better than we are. In fact, Paul even said in Romans, we're not, we shouldn't think of ourselves better than we are. <laughs> but soberly. Let alone other people. Now, the Bible uses the word leaven in the New Testament in negatively in three ways. And I think if we get the other two ways, it'll kind of shock us about how bad hypocrisy is. First, it uses it of immorality. Sin. 
And in 1 Corinthians 5, sexual sin, incest. And the Corinthians were dealing with it. And if you go, just go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Basically, Paul is upset, not just that the sin had happened in the church, but that the church had not dealt with it. And so he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You know the section. We don't have to read it all. That a man should have his father's wife and you're puffed up and have not mourned that he's done this deed might be taken away from among you, which doesn't mean he's not in the meetings, but means he's been removed his church from church membership and excommunication to shake him up from his carelessness and wickedness. For verily, absent in body, present spirit have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you're gathered together and by my spirit, by the power of the Lord Jesus, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Love that person enough to remove him from the church rolls and let Satan beat him up. Because he thinks he's saved and he's not. Your glory is not good. Know you not a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, for the church's sake and for this man's sake, discipline him. That's almost never done today. Now you can't discipline someone who's not a member. But if somebody needs discipline, they need to be disciplined. In this case, it was a very public sin and it needed to be publicly dealt with. And they weren't doing it. So he says, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as the unleavened, for even Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Jesus says something similar in Revelation 18, to that Jezebel that was teaching my servants to commit fornication. I give her space to repent, and she hasn't, and so forth. Now, what did the Corinthian church did? They did discipline this man, right? In the 2 Corinthians 2, he confessed, they forgave him. Paul says, now you forgive him now. He's confessed. Don't beat him up about this. They did the right thing. So immorality, if let go, will just spread all through the whole church. It's like leaven. Doctrinal error is another thing. You cannot let it go. It's like cancer. You can't let it go. You've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with it. It spreads. Leaven spreads in the whole loaf. And Dr. Noel do the same thing. Look in Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. This is the second thing that's called leaven in the New Testament. Speaking of the Pharisees' error, by the way, the, the Judaizers were Pharisees in background. That's Acts chapter 15. They're causing this problem. Emphasizing circumcision and ceremony and legalistic law keeping and stuff and Paul says in verse 7 Galatians 5 7 you did run well who cut in on you that you should not obey the truth this persuasion comes not of him that calls you a little leaven leavens the whole lump you let it go you let these people teach you let everybody listen to it you haven't dealt with it Dr. Arrow will wreck a church real fast doesn't take a lot just a little And I'm not talking about legitimate differences that Christians have. I'm talking about false doctrine. Doctrinal error. Now, the, the interesting thing was that the, what was the motive of this doctrinal error of these uh, Judaizers? It's very, very interesting. They had a motive. <coughs> Paul knows it. Galatians 4.17 They zealously seek you, but not for good. They would exclude you that you might seek them. But it is good to be zealously sought in a good thing and not, when I'm always, and not only when I'm present with you. They wanted the people in Galatia to seek them. It was self-promotion. <coughs> this whole, whole thing about the circumcision and keeping the law for them was a self-promotion thing. <coughs> in verse, chapter 6, verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, lest they should per suffer persecution for the cross. In other words, they got self. Fear of man, they don't want their fellow Jews to be against them. 
They want to be known as proselyting Gentiles, but not as Christians who broke in. Fear of man was driving this. Same thing that drove uh, even Barnabas to become a hypocrite in Galatians 2.13 <coughs> at the table when he moved from the Jewish table to the, or from the Gentile table to the Jewish table. So first it's used of immorality, second doctrinal error. It always spreads, it's got to be dealt with. A church that doesn't discipline, a church that has no standards on false doctrine, no stand against it, no stand on false living. We all fail, we all don't understand everything, but it's very important to be to deal with these things. So beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And that's the third way, is just being personally unreal. Uh, remember Jonathan Edwards had a problem in the church and it caused a split because the people before him allowed the halfway covenant. They let people who were unsaved take communion. John Edwards would have none of it. And that caused a big split. And that was a hard thing for him to do, but he knew it had to be done. And uh, allowing fake Christianity to be uh, <coughs> undealt with can wreck a church real fast. Just as fast as false doctrine or immorality. Can't do it. J.C. Rowell said, this is a standing caution for the whole church in every age. And uh, may God help us to know that. Okay, beware of the Leaven of the Pharisees. Be real. Second, be bold. Be bold. The Pharisees' problem was they feared men. And you even see that in Luke chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, and Matthew 26, 3 to 5. Oh, we're going to kill him, but not on the Sabbath day. Because we fear the people. And the same thing in Luke 20. We can't say that John the Baptist was from heaven or not from heaven because we fear the people. <coughs> they had this public opinion thing. <coughs> they were watching the polls. They wanted to be ingratiated with men. Paul didn't want that. If, I, if, I, if, if I'm preaching the gospel of circumcision, why am I not persecuted? You know? He knew why he was persecuted because he didn't get into that. So be real and be bold, unafraid of the opinions of God-hating, Christ-rejecting people. Turn back to Luke 12 and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, for there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, neither hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you've spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you've spoken in the ear in the private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And be bold. Be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, there's nothing more they can do. I'll forewarn you of whom you'll be afraid. Fear him who after he's killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say fear him. Be bold. Philip or R. K. Hughes said, The Pharisees' hypocrisy lay in their elaborate ritual piety that served as a veneer for their sinful con contamination and contaminating of other souls. But for the disciples, this is an important line, but for the disciples, it was a different twist. It meant downplaying their level of commitment to Christ. The Pharisees' commitment is they wanted to be in with all the people and retain their position. And they would teach things that would make people look up to them. The Christian it wants to be in, in the workplace, or in the school, or even in their denomination, just might be quiet when they ought to speak up. That's what he's, that's what he's really dealing with. In verse 3, therefore what you've spoken in darkness means, I'm a believer in Christ, I believe all the Bible, I believe salvation by grace, you know. But you don't say it to anybody else, you just kind of hold it in. Uh, 
Whatever you've spoken in darkness will be heard in the light, and that which you've spoken in the ear in private will be proclaimed on the housetops. You see, everybody you hide the truth from now is going to know you were a Christian on the judgment day. You were a Christian, you never gave me the gospel. You were a Christian, you never stood up at this against this wrongdoing. That's what R.K. Hughes is saying. The Pharisees' hypocrisy, their leaven, lay in the elaborate ritual piety that served as a veneer for the sinful contamination and their contaminating of souls. But for the disciples, it was a different twist. It meant downplaying their level of commitment to Christ. You see, if we're real... We should want people to know who we are and where we are. We've got to be real and be bold. William Kelly said the hypocrisy of the Pharisees had its root in the fear of man, and they did not fear God. Let's not fear people. Maybe they won't like me at work. Maybe they make fun of me at work. Maybe I won't get the grade I would get from that professor if I'm open about my faith. Let's not hide ourselves under a mask of being silent when we ought to be known. That doesn't mean you've got to witness to everybody you meet or got to speak up in every class and be against any, everything, anything a professor says. I didn't say that. I'm simply saying we should not be afraid in our regular life to be known as a Christian. I like to let people I meet know without being preachy. I might mention... Oh, I was at church last week. Or I might mention, oh, I'm a pastor. Now they know, right? That's good for me. That keeps me on my toes, right? I'm identified. I don't want to be hidden. I don't want to be hidden. It doesn't mean I get a chance to witness to everybody. I've got to give you John 3.16 because I've never met you before. So I've got to grab you by the shirt and I'm going to force it down your throat. No, but I at least want to be known. I want to be bold enough to be known as a believer. I'm not try to hide that. So be real. Be open. Be openly known as a believer in the neighborhood. Even if you can't always preach to everyone, you can, you can find ways to be known. And you can say things like, oh, someone said at church today, after church today. There's stuff you can say. Then people know, hey, that's a Christian. I can go to them if I got something. Or then they can start looking at you. Well, let's see if he really is one. So be known. Be bold. And uh, let's not hide ourselves. Uh, just try to be one of the crowd all the time. So be real. Be open. At, be open as a believer. And you don't know how many opportunities you may have. Lose the fear of man. Well, they won't like me. I won't be popular. Lose the fear of man by the fear of God. That's what he's talking about. Fear the one that can cast your people into hell. Fear him. Uh, be real. Be bold. When John Knox was buried, they said of him, Here lies one who feared God so much that he never feared the face of man. The fear of God will drive out the fear of man. I love God so much. I respect God so much. I'm, I, I want to please God so much that I'm willing to displease some of my family and some of my friends and some of my business workers. Again, I'm not saying we've got to wear our religion on our sleeve and everything like that, but we, we want to be known as Christians. It'll help us. So when that witnessing time comes, we've been prepared for it. We've already been open. It's not like, you're a Christian? I've known you 20 years. I never knew that. So that's the idea. Be real, be bold. In everyday life. And Earl Ellis said, long before persecution comes, long before persecution comes, the awfulness of hypocrisy in a believer of Christ is seen in its possible outcome, in its outcome under trial, and that's apostasy. If you want to be true under persecution, be true when there's not so much persecution. Be used to being different. Be used to being disliked. You'll be able to stand up better when you've got to speak for the Lord. 
And he went on and said, without a proper fear of God, a person becomes captive to the fear of man. Thus he's led to say the words of finality, Jesus be cursed. I, I got to have man's approval, so I just have to chuck my Christianity. That's what happened in the parable of the soils when persecution came. Their profession went out the door, Luke 8, 13. So be real, be born again. Uh, that's verses 1 to 3. Be bold. Uh, uh, and that's verses 4 and 5. I say to you, be, my friends, be not afraid of them that can kill the body. After that, no more they can do. They kill my body. They can't do anything else to me. Well, they might mutilate the body like the Catholics did to some of the people, but you won't feel it. You'll be in heaven. But I'll warn you, whom you'll fear, fear him who, after he's killed, has power to cast into hell. Fear him. Third, this is last, be encouraged. Be real, be bold, be encouraged. Verses 6 and 7. I need some encouragement if I'm going to risk martyrdom, I'll tell you that. They might cut my head off, they might shoot me, they might hang me, they might burn me, they might whatever. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. You know, people used to eat sparrows on a stick. I, I just can't already imagine that. It's considered a delicacy. Two for a penny. And a set of four for two pennies, they'd throw a fifth one in. It's like baker's dozen when you buy ears of corn. And so sparrows are here pictured as rather insignificant birds. They're not, you know, there's not that they're not that special to look at. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them, not one of them is forgotten before God. His eye is on the sparrow. Isn't that the, the gospel song? If his eye's on the sparrow, his eye's on me. We move from sparrows to hares. <laughs> but even the hairs of your head are numbered. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. That word numbered is very important. He's not counting how many that are on your head. By the way, some people have done that. Barclay says blondes have an average of 145,000 hairs. Dark-haired people have an average of 120,000 hairs. And redheads have an average of 90,000 hairs. Aren't you glad you know that now? <laughs> Unless you got male pot pattern baldness and then that throws it off, right? But, all right, you, that's not what he's doing here, though, that, that, that kind of thing. The hairs of your head are numbered. Which means God has a number for every hair on your head. Not just he knows how many are there, but every single hair of your head interest God much more than it interests you. If you could number the hairs of your head, would you do it? Oh, there's number 5,629. It just turned gray. Would you, would you do that? No, you wouldn't do that. You don't care that much about yourself. <coughs> so, it's a fascinating statement about God's interest and involvement and knowledge of our life. And it's a very important one. A sparrow doesn't fall except for the father. The Bible says that later, right? You, and so if a sparrow dies, uh, he, God knows about it. Not, and, and turn to Luke 21. I want you to get this one. We're, we're almost out of time. Luke 21. Verse 12. But before all these, they'll lay your hands on you, 21-12, and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues, to prisons, to be brought before kings and rulers of my namesake. Sounds like the book of Acts. Sounds like church history. Sounds like now. It'll turn to you for a testimony. Woo! We get to preach. This is, we got an audience. This is great. 
Settle it, therefore, in your mind, in your hearts, not to meditate before what you answer. Same kind of thing. This is not for Sunday morning. This is for these spontaneous persecution times. For I will give you a mouth and a wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to contradict or withstand. And you'll be betrayed by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you they'll cause to be put to death. You'll be hated of all men for my name's sake, and they'll not a hair of your head perish. What? How can they kill me and not have a hair of my head perish? Because you're going to get resurrected. <laughs> they could shave your head bald and then cut your head off, and you're not going to have a hair of your head perish. That encourages us hair challenge people. But what a blessing as is. And we can say to them, is that all you got? <laughs> Burn me at the stake. Chop my head off. Is that all you got? Put me in prison. Is that all you got? That's the picture. Riken entitles this whole section, Unafraid and Unashamed. Fearless before men because we fear God. So you need to be real. We need to be encouraged and we uh, be bold and we need to be encouraged. And that's before this time happens, right? Be real, be bold, be encouraged. That's a pattern of life. So that if and when it does happen, it may or may not happen, we're ready. Steve Lawson said, God reigns, not Satan, not rulers, not circumstances, not luck, not fate, not fortune, not karma, but God and God alone. If God wants us to be persecuted and stand up for him, give the gospel on our way out, thank you, Lord. I don't deserve that privilege. You're in control. We don't have to be popular with men. They can hate us. They can kill us. But God's truth will go forth by his spirit. We can be fearless before men if we fear God. We want to simply please him. All of this is a preparation of the speaker. So when that moment comes, you're ready for it. Next time, we're going to look at that. That moment. You've worked with these co-workers for months or weeks or years, and then the moment comes. It's your moment, and you can speak. Or you've got a family funeral, and your whole family that hasn't wanted to listen to you and you get your moment. Or other situation, maybe out and out persecution, like what's happening in Canada right now. May they, may they all be real, be bold, and be encouraged. No disgrace in going to jail for Jesus. No disgrace in losing your church building for Jesus. Our prayer should be for the Bible-believing pastors in Canada today. And we'll find out who's prepared and who's not. Uh, this was put in an auditorium, an athletic auditorium. It was a, it, it was, it's called the ultimate baseball training. Help wanted. Every athletic team should have a man who plays every position, never makes an error, and knows just what the opposition is planning. But so far, there's no way to get him to put down his popcorn and Coke and come down from the stands. <laughs> it's easy to look on and criticize other people's performance, right? May God help us to be in the game and not be afraid. Not just be criticizing others that don't do so well. But when we get our opportunity, and we may before we die, we may get that opportunity. We should count it the greatest privilege of our life to stand up for Jesus Christ and lose our building, our reputation, our everything, if that's what he wants us to do. Esther Joy Marsh, our missionary, you know, her husband's got severe cancer and they're suffering a lot. She posted this the other day on Facebook. 
it's God speaking in this, something that someone wrote. I turn coal into diamonds. I, I, I turn pearls, sand into pearls, and worms into a butterfly. I'm going to reread that. I messed that up. I couldn't read my own writing. I turn coal into diamonds, sand into pearls, and a worm into a butterfly. I can turn your life around too. Now I know there's some debate about coal going into diamonds, but it's good poetry, right? I turn coal into diamonds, sand into pearls, and worms into butterflies. I can turn your life around. If you're not real, you can't get real. Everything we said as a teenager, get real, is wrong. The unreal can't get real. They need God to make them real. For us to be bold, he's got to make us bold. The fear of God drives out the fear of man. And God has to encourage us. No matter what they think, no matter what they do, I can stand up for my Lord. Because the hairs of my head are numbered and his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Father in heaven, we come before you today and uh, we pray that that would be true of our church as we see the battles heating up and we see that things might be coming our way that might be unpleasant, might be difficult. Help us to prepare ourselves by your grace, or better put, be prepared by your grace to be real, to be bold, to be encouraged. And draw upon that. And draw upon the problems of the day to realize we don't need to be popular with God-hating, Christ-rejecting, wicked apostates that hate you and hate us because they hate you. We need to love them and proclaim the gospel to them and stand up for our Lord. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.